So, yes, thanks, Kenneth. Yeah, I'm, uh, this whole, the whole heart behind today's presentation was, if I was to teach someone to be a brander, what would I need to teach that person? Okay, and uh, and and this thought. Uh, took almost 15 years to come to be. I've been doing this since 2002. Uh, graduated from an, like an art school, like I graduated from MD Carr, which Ooh, teaches you right. zero yeah. business <laughs> knowledge. Okay, and they don't even teach you how to file or like how to like sell anything, basically. Yeah. Um, and I graduated with a fine arts degree, I think, I'm not sure what it was, uh, in mixed media, okay? Uh, and five companies later, uh, I started my current one that I, in 2008, called Stuck Apart, and I will be explaining to you guys, well, A, where that name came from, and, uh, and hopefully that would play into the whole ethos of what I'm going to be talking about, okay? Uh, so first off, uh, welcome. You know, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. Uh, we have a prior presenter with us, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> okay, she's the. Her and her team are here, and uh, very honored that you guys are. You know, just listening to me uh, for like an hour and a half. <laughs> My goodness, God, God have mercy on you guys. <laughs> okay, uh, and this process typically would take two weeks for me to go through with my clients. But I'm gonna try to do it within an hour and then half an hour where you can do some exercises, fill out some questions, talk amongst yourself and all that, okay? So I have a lot of content and not a lot of time. So let me just kind of get right into it. Um, okay, so brand. I am extremely passionate about this human phenomenon, okay? There's, if it wasn't for us, brands actually won't even exist. And that's one of the first things uh, that I tell my clients to shift. It's like, we are the only creatures on this planet that have created this concept called brand. And for the last 15 years, uh, this is my life's process and I'm here to document, A, my fascination towards it, or in it, and then my approach. So if this is something that interests you, you're welcome to stay. If it doesn't, well, you can still stay. But if you leave, I'm okay, okay? So when you learn, when I, you know, as a, as a student of anything, there's, there's certain things that I need to I grab hold of. Number one, there is a mental approach to something. So in this presentation, I'm gonna teach you my mental approach. And then second, I'm gonna teach you my design approach. And both these approaches are, I'm gonna to try to go as detailed as I can. Uh, and if you guys need me to stop and slow down, just let me know, okay? And then the last thing is for you to practice some of the things I'm gonna teach you guys, okay? So without further ado, Let's go. I'm gonna punch you guys out. So number one, the mental process. Like, when I graduated at Emily Carr, uh, back in 2002, my goodness, I'm really old. Um, uh, there was no, there was not a lot of content out there to learn about brand. There's a lot of design books. There's a lot of marketing books. But in terms of a brand book, there really wasn't very much. So I had to like figure out this concept called brand uh, on my own. And I don't wanna bore you guys on my journey, but my entry point for tonight is actually these two words, brand and the following word is identity, okay? And wh every time I read this or think about it, I find it's actually quite odd because the word identity stands out and to me this is a very interesting way to describe a brand and that interesting the, the reason why it's interesting is it's 
it, it's like a clue to me because it usually describes something that's alive. Like you won't go, what is the identity of this chair? You won't say that. And it's typically, most often, you use the word identity to describe a person. And I find it really odd that brand is described as a person. Does it make sense? So that means brands should be alive. But how come a lot of people approach it as if it's an inanimate object? And uh, the thing that I want to shatter is stop thinking of it as just an object. You start thinking of it as something that's living. Okay? Again, you would never go, what's the identity of an inanimate dead thing? So, in this process, I started shifting my mind. I'm okay, if brands are alive, right? What do living things do? Right? What do living things do? Biology. So, cracked open my book, went online, searched. Biology kind of dictates to us that <clears throat> living things have an underlining goal, and it is to multiply and survive. Survive and multiply. So, all animals has that ability. A cat can make more cats, right? A dog can make more dogs. And that's kind of cool, like we can make more humans. That's part of our, that's part of how we are built, right? And Jen Jennifer can attest to that. Making one, All right? right now. Right. Well, you're just sitting right there. <laughs> okay, so, so animals can do that and so can like plant life. A tree can make more trees, okay? But here's the, here's the cool thing I find. We're the only creature on this planet that the thing that we make, our creation, has the ability to recreate. Ever think about that? What do you think cities are? Cities grew because we created, it probably started with a family, a little village, it came a little community, and then it just keeps growing, okay? What we create has the ability to recreate. And that, to me, is the foundation of what I think brands are. Because businesses do that, okay? Big, if, just, just think about it. All the top 500 brands or companies in the world, they didn't start off small. They grew. And some of those founders don't even exist anymore. Why is that? Okay, so that's why I think brands are a human thing. It is. It's so tied to our humanity uh, that you can walk into any city and you can instantly tell the, the wealth of the city, the trends of the city, the economic growth of the city, just by looking at what's there, what type of brands are there. And that's significant. And, it, and it, I think brands are actually part of our survival. Can you imagine where there's no more warning signs when things are not branded that way? Okay? Um, so when I say this is a human phenomenon, I really mean it. And I'm like, the more I look into it, the philosophy and the psychology behind it, uh, it indicates to me that this thing is not, you cannot describe it with a, with a sentence. It has to be more than that. The question is, what is that for? Okay? So everything we create ends up being branded anyways. It doesn't matter what it is. A movement, you can start in your living room and then you start spreading it to your, your, your neighborhood. Eventually, it's gonna get branded. What do you think Christmas is? Or Thanksgiving? Or the green movement? All of these are, they're not, they're brands, really. We, we branded it and it's growing and it's expanding, and that's the purpose of the things we make. And the reason why we brand everything, or everything we create is branded, uh, is something in us, we want to brand something that's significant. If it's significant, we want it to do exactly what all living things do, survive and multiply. And I can prove this to you guys. How many of you guys have a business here? Okay, when you guys founded your business, you probably looked at yourself and go, okay, I'm gonna make an assessment of who I am. 
and I'm going to inject, embed the best part of me into this thing called my company. Okay? And you, do, you probably do this either intentionally or unintentionally. <laughs> but that's essentially what it is. You, you take the best parts of who you are as a person and you go, okay, I'm going to only put the best stuff, okay? And if I need partners, I want them to put their best stuff and hopefully their best stuff complements my best stuff. So right there is the first form of multiplication. Because the thing that you just created is actually mirroring you. It is your reflection, it is your, it's almost like your child. And, and, and I understand why people call their business their child, okay? And like the people who you do business with is almost like you're married to them. And we use these words to describe our business uh, relationships and our, our, our business ideas. And it's so deeply emotional that it's hard to talk about a brand without being emotional. And when I talk to MBA masters, uh, MBA people, or like, or very analytical business people, they talk, they describe brands in a very analytical way. And it's true, they can be very analytical. They can be very uh, uh, sterile. But at the same time, you can also describe brands in a very humane way. And I always figure, why can we do that? And here's why. It's because when we brand a business, essentially you're saying, I want to brand the most significant part of who I am, and I want whatever the thing I just branded to survive and multiply. That's in your head, in your heart, whether or not you intend to think about it or not. So the first thing, when you come up with any type of idea, if you understand this concept, it would fundamentally change your approach altogether. So, brands are what? You can say this, what is a brand? And you can come up with a Martin Niermer answer that says it's a gut feeling that a person has towards a product, service, or business. That is a true definition. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, one way to describe a brand, you can call it as who is a brand. And that will give you a whole new way of expressing the definition of a brand. And even that will be true. So, give an example. Apple is like probably the one, the, the most quoted, used brand in all <laughs> brand presentations. So I'm gonna use it. You can say, what is Apple? You can answer that in your head, or you can write it down on a piece of paper. You can also say, who is Apple? And you also come up with some answers yourself. And both methods are true. They're both true. If you're gonna look at a brand, you have to answer what it is first, but you also have to ask yourself, well, who is it? And most likely, it's you. So, the, so now, who are you? We have a room full of strangers, except for my wife, to me, okay? I don't know who you guys are but I can guarantee all of you guys are wearing glasses. All of you. Both metaphorically and physically. And here's how I, here's, here's why I describe this. The world is a chronological, unbiased reality. The data of reality is so great that I don't think our human brains can absorb everything. So how do you, how do you live in a world where data is so abundant and chronological and unbiased? Well, you translate it. You translate it through your lens of interpreting the world. And there are, what, 20 people in here? 20 to 20 something odd people? You guys are experiencing this event at the same time with, with me, okay? And at the end of tonight, I'm pretty sure I would, if I were to ask you guys, hey, what'd you think of tonight? I will get roughly 20 to 25 different, slightly different interpretations, okay? It's because your glasses translate this world in the way that only you want it to, or that in the way that you're kind of made for. And 
I find this also very fascinating is because in the business world, everyone wants to say, oh, you gotta be unique. You gotta be, you gotta be differentiated from everyone else, even though you're selling bubble tea, okay? The differentiating factor isn't the product. The differentiating factor is, well, how are you, how, what's your opinion about that product? And we will have a vast array, and there's only one set of glasses per person. There's no one else like you. So you want to, so first we talk about brands being alive and it's supposed to be, you know, survive and multiply. Now, we have to talk about, well, how do I even look at a brand or look at the world? And now you have to start defining what your glasses are actually are, right? And the better you are at this, this ability to translate and interpret your own glasses, the better you are at finding your uniqueness and actually explaining it and being influential about it. So, you guys are all here because I'm, because you're entrepreneurial. So now I'm talking about your perspective now, your glasses. Again, I don't know what you guys are seeing, but I can guarantee you this, you guys see this line in the market. Everyone sees a line. And this line is called status quo. Everyone sees it. Everyone has a different interpretation of what this status quo is in your respective market. And if you are here because you want to you want to exercise your entrepreneurial bug or the, your leadership skills, you're looking at this line and saying, it sucks. It's rubbish. It shouldn't be like this. It's horrible. It actually should be like that. Because the way I see it is the status quo is not good enough. I believe there's a new standard. And I believe... I'm the guy or the girl who can make that happen. So when I talk to business owners and people who want to start businesses, when they say that to me, I don't interpret that they want to physically make a business. In my mind, when they say, I want to start a business, what they're really saying to me is, I want to be a leader. And then, so therefore, my next question to you isn't, well, what are you going to lead? The real question should be, how are you going to lead it? How are you going to lead it? Because only leaders can do this. You need to up the status quo, but you need to know how. So how do we do it? This is how I interpret it. This is how I understand it. So I have a graph. I made this graph almost like 10 years ago. And, and this is like one of the first times I'm showing it in, on a somewhat larger scale. <laughs> it's usually one-on-one. -on -one. So I designed this graph. I wanted, to, I wanted to understand what goes behind the scenes of a business and how does that relate to a brand? And then how does that enrich the world, okay? So I'm a big believer in servant leadership. So whoever wants to be a leader, I want them to subscribe to serving people and that's how I lead. And most business owners are like that. They see a need in the market and no one is serving that need, so let me do it. I'll step up to the plate, I'll lead in that area. And most of the time, that's the case, okay? So how do you do it? You're a business owner. Business owners have a colorful imagination because they are able to think about the future in such vivid detail that they think it's real, okay? And if you can't do that, but you are a visionary person, then practice how to make that future crystal clear. And the clearer it is, the better it is for you to get there. So here's what happens to most uh, business owners. I wanna start a business, whoops. And I have a vision. And that vision leads all the way to like the new status quo, okay? And, you might sit in this state for a little while. You might sit on it for a couple days or a couple years. It doesn't matter. You do is just internally ingest it and digest it. And it. This, you know, building up some motivation and, and some confidence. Okay, and then you go, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. The next logical thing that you're going to do is how much is this going to cost? What's my sacrifice? 
I have a vision. It's going to cost me something, but how much? And you don't know how much until you figure out what type of goods and services you're going to make. You go, okay, I'm going to make this stuff in, in Canada or in China or in the U.S. Okay, I'm going to serve people. I'm going to have this technology. This is all going to cost X amount of dollars. That's my base cost. And then rent. And then all in staff and licensing fees and accounting fees and lawyer fees, bank fees. Thank God BEC doesn't have a lot of fees. Right? It doesn't plug in for you. <laughs> okay? And then you calculate a cost. But it's still partial cost. cost. Because the next thing is, well, how am I going to deliver my goods and services to people? Am I going to have a store? Am I going to have an online store? Am I going to have a restaurant? Are people going to come to my office, in, in my house? Am I, you know, all these things. Am I going to have a car for this? All these things put together creates cost, your price. Okay? And like most imaginative entrepreneurs, you also envision what my future office is going to look like. <laughs> How many do that? I do, I, I do that. Okay, I might, I might be the only one. But anyway, whatever. Okay? Culture is going to happen regardless of you knowing it or not. Okay, so how do I describe, how do I define culture? Culture is the way you relate to people consistently over time. And then when you do that enough times, it actually builds a habit with other people doing the same thing. Okay, so remember I said your business is a reflection of you? So how you treat people around you on a personal level is going to be very close to how your business is going to treat people when you run the business. Okay? So the more you understand, well, how do I relate to people, the easier it is and the better it is for your company to build this culture. And then you're going to, you're going to hire some HR professional to come in and jot it all down, put it into policies. And that's going to go into cost. So now you have, I have a vision, and I have all these things that I need to do to fulfill this vision. And I go, okay, I did all my homework, I'm ready to launch, and I'm about to introduce it into the world. On the brand side, they don't know who you are at all, okay? And at every step of the way, people are gonna judge you. And their judgment or their estimation of who you are or the value of what you can bring is their brand definition of, 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 of you, basically. So we have these five levels of economics in a business sense. There's also five levels of brand economics. And I'm gonna break it down for you guys. Number one, people are gonna judge you by your price. Your price is heavily related to your cost. Would you not agree? And then people are gonna judge you for your quality for your goods. And they're also gonna judge you on your service. And then right there, you just met status quo. Or another way of saying it, minimum expectation line. This is the minimum expectation. And this is how I know this is the minimum expectation. This will never happen in reality. When I go to a restaurant, I expect the pricing to be exuberantly expensive I expect the food to taste like crap, and I expect the service to be rude and disrespectful. That's my expectation. I go to the restaurant, and oh my goodness, to my surprise, the price is not that bad, or not that expensive. The food is quite fresh, and people didn't slap me. My goodness, this restaurant just blew my mind. <laughs> Never happens. Everyone will always go into any business engagement they expect you to be fairly priced, your quality uh, of goods should be good, and to be treated well. That's your minimum expectation. And what I discovered, a lot of businesses stop at that level of branding. And you see that everywhere. Buy one, get one free. Free delivery, fastest internet, whatever, la 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 la, okay? If you fall in, if you're marketing, falls into that trap, that means you're actually selling minimum expectation, okay? But I want, and you will never, if that was the case, you will never break past the status quo. You will never leave. So how do you leave? Well, 
getting good service, having good quality, being reasonably priced is one thing. But your company culture, how you how you are managing your company is going to reflect on your customer's experience. Because if you have, how many guys have went shoe shopping at all those and then the, the salesperson hates their job and all they can do is, I hate this job. These shoes suck. But if you want it, it's only, it's only $39.99. Okay? How culture, great, because you just, you just multiplied your, your personality into other people and you want them to treat people like that and how they treat people is going to give them their experience. Okay? And then they'll, oh, if, you're, if you pass that level, then they're going to go, you know what, I want to see what you stand for. And then they're going to listen and read about and learn about your vision, which is essentially your opinion on the market. How you translate in the market, how you're unhappy with it, and why, why no one is doing this, but I will do this for you. You guys are suffering a lot, a lot. Elon Musk is trying to save the world by getting people off petroleum. That's his narrative. And he sacrifices a whole, whole lot of his life and resources to do that. And he sacrifices other people's resources to do that. And if you are able to clearly see how that person or how that company interprets the world, uh, you have a choice if you want to join it or not. And that's essentially what brands are. Their opinions try to influence your opinions. It's either you're influenced or you're not. And if you listen to all the narrative of business owners and entrepreneurs and brands out there, they're essentially trying to convince you of their opinion is the better opinion in some shape or form. Okay? Okay, so, make sense so far? Okay, so, okay, I kind of have a picture of this triangle thing, right? The five levels of economics, both on the business side and also on the brand side. Well, what are these points? Well, on the brand point, if you actually fulfill and do it properly, you're giving people a tremendous amount of value. Because they don't talk about how much does it cost, it's actually, it's worth it. But on the business side, you actually get a lot of reward. I used to, in this, on the business side, I used to put profit here. Because that was like the easiest way to sell like hardcore masters, people, people with MBAs. If I tell, if you get rewards, you'd be like, reward, I want profit. <laughs> okay, reward encompasses profit. But if you are gonna serve people for the better, if you're able to do it, you actually do get a reward. And it's self-perpetuating. It, it will actually make you wanna do it more. And then what about this point? This point is design. So when people talk about design, I don't see it as graphic design. I see it, how well are you able to design these two things and how aligned are you able to do it? And this is really hard to do. Talk is cheap, okay? But this, if you can do this properly, you're done. It's good, okay? And at the same time, when, you, when it's done properly, your business essentially is your brand. And I always, I always have this debate with, uh, with uh, uh, business people or business owners. And I was really young, right? I, you know, I, I started out when I was 21 years old, 22, and I'm like knocking on doors of businesses and you see like, and I'm there, I'm telling them, your business is your brand. And I'm like, what are you talking about? La, la, la. You know I me? Mean? And then and then I'm like, I have to prove it in some shape or form. Until I read a case study on uh, Huggies. Okay? On Huggies. So when Huggies came out back in the uh, I think 1960s, 1970s, their mission statement was keeping babies bottom dry. And the only thing that they made were diapers. But not any diaper, the best diaper in the market. And they monopolized and they dominated the entire US and North, North America at the time. And when the business have already reached their market cap, they can't make any more diapers. You know what I mean? Everyone who would be buying diapers are already buying diapers. So how do we grow as a business? And then the execs and the, 
the CEO and the president, they all came down and said, you know what, we're gonna change our mission statement to no longer say keeping babies bottoms dry, we're gonna change it to helping moms raise happy, healthy babies. And then the media shift into that new statement, they're no longer about diapers. They're now diapers and diaper bags and, and wipes and, and clothing and like strollers and like you name it, whatever a mom needs to help her raise a happy, healthy baby, that's what they made. And instantaneously, they have more than one product. So I usually ask those, uh, uh, my, my clients, I go, was that a business decision or was that a branding decision? And essentially, they're the same decision. So I don't have a, sl I was debating on putting this slide. I had a coin, and when you think about a brand, it's one side of the coin. When you think of a business, it's on the other side of the coin. But it's the same coin. Okay, so that's what this is. Okay, so this is <clears throat> this is you interpreting the market. You've seen status quo. I want to be a leader. I want to raise it up. This is your interpretation. This is what you see through your lens. I think it's time that I share with you what's my lens. What are my glasses? Besides it being black metal frames. Here's my glasses. I interpret the world like this. The market is full of circles and dots. Let me explain. For the purposes of this presentation, I made a fictitious brand called Epic Coffee. The problem with this brand is that I make shady coffee. But I make amazing donuts. Really, really groundbreaking donuts. So give me an example. Let's say Kenneth comes to my shop and orders a cup of coffee. I go, oh, great, here's a cup of coffee. He drinks it and spits it in front of my face. So this is mud. How can you serve such horrible coffee? And I go to Kenneth, oh, I'm so sorry. Here's a cup of tea, and here's a complimentary donut. Kenneth drinks the tea, it's nice, eats the donut, the donut takes him to the mood. He's it's stratospheric, he's having the best time in his life. And he goes to me, this is the best donut ever. And he leaves, and he's happy. And then he bumps into my wife, Ashley, and Ashley goes to Kenneth, Hey, Kenneth, I need a place to have some coffee. Where can you recommend? Kenneth will recommend every coffee shop online, basically. But if Ashley goes to Kenneth, hey, Kenneth, where's a good donut shop? Kenneth will go, you should go to Epic Coffee. And then Ashley will come into my, show, into my shop and go, hey, Daniel, I hear you have amazing donuts. And right there and then, my brand isn't coffee, my brand is donuts. So I changed my name to no longer Epic Coffee, it's now Epic Donuts. And in this exchange, I just illustrated the most important thing you need to do to build reputation. Because if you do it properly, people are gonna follow you and get stuck to you. That's why my company is called Stuck, okay? So reputation, what is it really? It's your ability to build and protect relationships. So Ken, so I actually came in and I, I built that new relationship with her. But it's also mending and restoring relationships. Kenneth, I gave him bad coffee. I apologized. I rectified that. I gave him a donut as a complimentary uh, sorry. And I rebuilt that exchange and I rebuilt that relationship. So when people talk about brand reputation, unless they talk about this, they don't know what the heck they're talking about, okay? So build and protect, mend and restore. That's how people get stuck to you. So Epic Coffee, Epic Donuts, doing quite well, okay? And then I'm like, shoot, there's a competitor now. Creeping up my hood, what do I do? Well, what will actually happen in the market is both companies or both brands will pivot slightly and they will actually move apart. So that's why I'm not just stuck, I'm also stuck apart. 
My job is to help people get stuck to you while you get apart from everyone else. So when I say the market is full of circles and dots, I see a confetti full of the circles and dots everywhere and they're pulsating like hearts because they're people. And you see circles grow and collapse, blink and, and disappear everywhere. And that's how I interpret the market and that that's how I approach it. Like, what's your circle and what's your dot? And then what can we do to make them better? Does it make sense? Okay, so that's the mental part. Now to talk about the design part. Okay, is everything okay? You guys are awfully quiet. All right. Okay. How am I out of time? So let's talk about the design. So now that I kind of shared with you the way that my brain works and how I interpret the market and how I see the world, I'm going to share with you physically, tangibly, how I design and what are what are the structures and the, and the processes I use to design. One thing I have to recognize is that your every all ideas are like that in their in people's heads. It's like a knot. And it's jungled up like ten year old Christmas lights. Okay? And it's not like you can't think of your or, or focus on your idea. You're most likely you're focused on multiple areas of your idea. And then and then hopefully you can graft everything back together again. So you stay clumped up, and you're trying to piece it together while you're clumped up. Does that make sense? Okay, so right off the bat, I'll tell my clients, stop thinking. Just tell me what you see. Just tell me what you see. Okay, tell me about your market. How, how well do you know your market? How deep are you in your market? And then that gives me the opportunity to go study the market. And I go, I do a very deep dive and I study everything. It's like if I can get my hands on it, I'll, I'll study it. Because if I were to help my client, I have to know what they know. Otherwise, how am I gonna help them? How can I give them guidance, okay? So for you guys, when you, when you have your idea, it's all jumbled up, all you have to do is don't think about it. Just tell me what you see. Jot down your observation. Jot down your opinion. And then in the midst of that, you go, okay, I want, I think my idea is around here, in this vicinity, okay? And then the next thing I want you to do is clarify and crystallize your opinion. How are you translating the market in the first place? Write that down understand that so people who do content marketing how many how many people do content marketing you have a marketing guy here. no okay. okay when you when you do content marketing this is part of the plan you you write down your opinions and themes and then you you write a plan for it over 12 months or six months or whatever okay so you have an opinion and then you have a solution Based on your opinion and your interpretation of the market, this is what I think the solution should be. And then like every brand, because people are very emotional, you have to think about what type of feeling I want people to have. So Coca-Cola is about happiness, Apple is about encouragement, encouraged to do what's creative. These are emotional words. So you have an opinion, you have a solution, and now you want, this is what I want people to feel. And then this is like the peripheral uh, landscape to understand what your ideology is. Ideology is basically uh, your why by Simon Sinek, okay? This is your value system. This is your governance. This is your, your character. This is your, your, your principles on how you're gonna reproduce decisions, okay? And, and most people may not know their ideology quite yet, but when you talk about their opinion and you listen to what type of solution they want and what type of feeling they want people to have, you kind of piece together the peripherals of what that ideology is, which then gives us 
better ways to really crystallize what those ideologies are. But then what about these three areas? It feels very incomplete. So when you have an opinion and you know why you have that opinion and you know why you have a solution, then you have a message. You know exactly what you want to say. And this is very, like messaging is, um, it could be very, sometimes it could be very like, like functional and beneficial. Here's the, here's the function and the benefits of this of this product, of this solution. It could be fact-based. It could be, uh, it could be like very straightforward. You don't need to be colorful. Just know exactly what, like the 30, like the 30 second elevator pitch, you're not telling them a story, you're telling them a message, okay? So when you have these three areas, you kind of, your message kind of comes into play a little bit because you, it needs to reflect your opinion and it, it needs to communicate your solution. Well, what about opinion and feelings and, and ideology? Well, that's just story. Because feelings are like your symbolisms and your metaphors and I'm the color red and you're the color blue or whatever. But, it's, but messaging is very different than storytelling. Storytelling is actually what gets people to understand what type of relationship they're going to have. How relatable are you? Are you romantic or are you not? Are you gonna save the planet or not? It could be very grandiose, it could be very lofty. Your story could be touching, like World Vision's you know, story. Like, it could be all those things. It, and, it, and, it, and it gets, you're able to form it so much easier when you know what you wanna say and you, want, and you know what pe you want people to feel like. And then you know what the metaphors are and the, and the symbols are like, it's way easier. And how about solutions and feelings and ideology? So we have, we have touchy-feely stuff with tangible stuff. When you put them together, you get style. This is design. I now know what I'm designing, what my website is going to look like, what my packaging is going to look like. And because I already know what I'm going to say, and I know what my story is, and I know what type of metaphors I'm going to have, designing is so much easier. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to do any of the groundwork. It's already kind of there. Okay. So like, as a designer, I, my style guides are in the style, my, my packaging schemes, my campaign schemes. And campaigning is basically what you wanna sell right now, what is the key messaging, what's the story behind it, what's the feeling, and I'm gonna pump out a, a campaign right away. It's gonna be a six month campaign. I'm gonna focus on one feature. And then here, you know what I mean? Like, this is like a, a jigsaw puzzle that you just kind of jig around. And when you do all this, people are gonna experience every aspect of your brand, and then that's what gives them their experience. Okay? And now in the, whoops, in the experience part, this could be your touch points, your email blasts, your sales reps, your website, your phone call, whatever. You could be as specific as you want in when you design experiences, or you could be as you know, loose cannon as you want. And then in this structure, you know, sometimes you, you can actually hire professionals in very specific areas just for that area. You know what I mean? Like, I can't do all of it. There's, you know, I don't know how to do logistics. I mean, hire someone who can. That's part of it. You know what I mean? That you have some sort of governing tool that you want them to, to work with. So this is how I design. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Did I lose anyone? Okay. okay. So here comes the workshop. Woohoo! So I kind of prepared. So I have a I have a this whole process is called the working brand. It means the brand is gonna work. But at the same time, you need to work. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you maybe you guys can just pass it, pass it down, and then, and then we're kind of go through it. Hold on, give me a 
guys. I'm so behind. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I know. But you know what? I think we can. I think we can do some parts of it. <clears throat> so I gave you guys the triangle and the circles, um, in case you guys didn't try it. Okay. So here comes the workshop part. And knowing me, I didn't bring a. I didn't prepare pens for anyone. So, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> okay. So today. I think we can work on the feeling part. And I have a very simple exercise for us to do. And then I'm gonna give you a structure to write a story, which you can do on your own afterwards. So, in the document you'll see a graph like this. This is, I don't know what this thing's called, but it's a tool that I use to help me figure out what are the descriptor words that will best describe who you are. And there are many exercises out there on the market. I just picked the shortest one for tonight. And uh, it, is a, it is a graph. It's neither nor, it's in between as well. Okay, because no one's always 100% vintage. You're always somewhere in between. So, if you can, think about your brand or you, the future business that you want and try to stylize it in some ways. Okay? And then I will show you my answers to what I think mine is. I need feedback. So the only way that you can get feedback is actually if you have a relationship with people on some level. I might be a stranger to you, but over an hour and a half, maybe we're best of buds now. Who knows? Okay? So this is how I brand like if I were to like describe my company, my presentation, this is what I came up with. And then you might disagree with me. And that disagreement is a discourse that we need to talk about because it's important to have that conversation. If you're not even able to have that conversation to begin with, you're dead in water already. And then you, you know what I mean? So, <clears throat> so in the, in the worksheets, after the, the, the scripted words, I ask two more questions, which is what type of metaphor is best to describe your brand? That's something you guys can think about and ponder about. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, if you don't know what that is yet, maybe you can look at brands that you love and just study what, why do you love them so much? And then see if you can conjure up a story for yourself and a metaphor, okay? And then when you come to storytelling, here is a very basic bare bones structure. You can apply this to websites, you can apply this to your story, you can apply this to the messaging part of your brand, you can apply this to any type of communication collateral. But here's just the general structure, okay? And it kind of emulates that, the round diagram that I have. First, it's context, you have to know what the problem is. Because sometimes you need to tell people what the problem is, because they may not even know, okay? Uh, and then you have to figure out, well, where you're going to compete. It's, and then you have to have a goal. You have to know what you want. You have to have a solution to something. And it has to be measurable. And it has to be, you have to, you have to keep an eye on it to always make sure that you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? And then purpose, well, you have to tell, in the story, it could be, you can tell them, well, why are you doing this? The promise is very, how I describe promise is, well, what do you deliver? So if you're gonna say you're gonna do this and this and this, that's promise, then you gotta do it. If you don't, if you don't intend to promise what you're, you're about to say, then don't even say it in the first place, because you're setting up false expectations. Anyways, so that's uh, part of uh, the story. 
And then obviously your guiding principles, uh, this is what makes you unique. So here you can, some people use humor, some people use product delivery, some people use management style, you could be the first to market, whatever, like whatever makes you really unique, uh, you kind of throw that in. It's like, a, it's like a pearl necklace. Just imagine your work, and the string is the context, okay? And every little pearl are these little uh, conduits to talk about your story. And then you could, you could take them apart and rearrange them in accordance to what's the most effective way. Figure out who your audience is, mm -hmm. who do you want to serve, mm -hmm. Then obviously your value proposition is it. How are you going to do it? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I use this structure when I when I content write for a website, and then I go okay. I have I have a board and I write everything out in point form, and then when I go to the website, I kind of I kind of like it's almost like I'm mixing up a cocktail, and I'm like put, plugging in content wherever I need it. Okay, but this eventually will become a content bible if you do it properly. Uh, and you have a short little exercise that you can go back to your offices at home and you can talk about your team or yourself and you can kind of write it out. Okay? What I typically find is if you do the, the circles right, this comes really easy. Okay? And that concludes my presentation. So thank you so much. A, there's a, a design studio out on uh, in uh, Carisdale called Studio Faculty. Uh, they have a they have a, a store called Sort Days, and it's these really cool, very Japanese, very minimalistic uh, uh, boutique in the front, and in the, the back is their is their design studio. Like their aesthetic is not my aesthetic, but I love their aesthetic. And they are, they are true protectors of their aesthetic. They're real stickler on their own style. And that diligence is actually what made them really successful. Uh, and for me, when I, when I look at them, it's very inspiring it's because it tells me, because back in the day, back in the 2000s or even pre-2000s, uh, design agencies, they don't have a style. It's whatever you want, I will find someone to do it for you in that style that best suits you. And they conform to the client. But studio faculty is the opposite. People conform to their style. They hire them for their aesthetic. They don't yield. They're like, they're like the straightest arrow. And it took them so long to actually do that because I hired them to design some logos for me before. They were like doing all these odd jobs, but then over time they really stuck to their guns and they have this immaculate, beautiful point of view on beauty. And they're so authentic about that. You know, and it, and it causes me to think about, well, what's my style? Like I'm kind of minimal, but I'm not like that, like very hipsterish, very like, you know, have you heard of Serial Magazine? Is anyone? Okay, anyways. Um, they're the art directors for Serial Magazine. And they're, it's a global publication. Okay, so check them out. Studio faculty. Sortes. Love them. Great guys. If you're ever in there, say, tell them the Dan says hi. Uh, another question, Tommy, is a question. Uh, you had some stories about people who didn't listen to you, but how about some uh, successful stories? Can you uh, share those? Oh. <clears throat> Um, 
maybe come back next year and I'll tell you about the project I'm working on now. <laughs> no, like seriously. But because <clears throat> I took about a three year hiatus break. Uh, this is like my first year back into the market. So I'm working on two brands. Well, the two brands that are, that are more prominent. One's the, the failed skincare brand that I'm redoing. We found a new market. I'm super excited about this one. I came up with a really awesome concept. Can't wait to show it to the world. I think we're gonna kill it. Because uh, there's only one product, so all of our resources and, our, and all of our attention is towards this one thing. It's, it's gonna be wonderful, okay? And then <clears throat> another one's a software company. Uh, they, they're B2B, their, their product is so specific that uh, they only target companies that require GIS, so global information system. And they have this powerful tool to help oil companies, construction companies, land development companies, governments, energy companies, uh, to manage hundreds and hundreds of acres of land and the development on it. The product is so specific that no common person will ever use it, but they're having a communication problem because they don't know how to communicate it because it's so rare. And I came in and I did a complete overhaul, changed their name, I asked them who is the villain of your industry. They said Excel, Microsoft Excel Sheets are our ultimate villain. I'm like, all right, the villain is Excel. You're the hero. Let's go kill it. And then and off we off to the races. Um, and I think we're going to launch uh, hopefully next year. And the founder of that company has already agreed to be a startup brand speaker. So when that happens, I will tell all you guys to come. And this is the company that this is the. This is the, uh, the product that I designed for him, and, uh, and uh, see how that goes. Uh, but one of, the, one of the brands, okay, how many of you guys heard of a company called Sue Jerky? Yeah. Okay, did you know that they changed their logo over the last couple of years? No? Okay. Uh, let me see if I can find. Okay, well, sorry, just, just so I can answer your question, I, I'm, I'm doing this. Oh, okay, you know what, when we were telling you about corner block, maybe I can show you corner block. So that's their brand, corner block. Mm -hmm. There's a corner on the corner of the B. <laughs> uh, this was their old logo, O2H, which I designed back in 2008. I was like a, a student of the arts. And then I switched them from this to this, gave them a, a scheme, gave them packaging. So this is an actual flyer. Uh, corner block, your healthy, friendly corner store, and then change the wrong corner. And this, this is a delivery car. So like, because Hong Kong is a very vertical city, so when people look down at, so I wanted to make sure that they, they get branding on top, so change the wrong corner. It would be really, because it's really cool when, they, when, the, when the van turns corners. It's literally, it's, you know what I mean? It's like change the wrong corner. Okay, um, so uh, update on them. Ever since we changed them, uh, their clientele base increased because people remember them. 
okay? Uh, they now shifted away from organic and they went into more supplements. And because the store is both generic and specific at the same time, they're free to do so. If they do one day choose to make food, they can, because their name can allow them to make food. So when you got the name Corner Block and your slogan has the word corner, you connected the two. Yeah. How important is that? That's very important. It's because uh, people might remember them as just corner block because it's one word. And actually, their their business plan was uh, uh, they were gonna go. So Hoko has train stations all over the city. Okay, these and they're very elaborate. And in these stations, there are also retail outlets. And when I, came, when I came up with the name Corner Block, it was actually a combination of two things. Number one, it's Corner Stone, which is an anchor point for buildings to rest its weight on, its support. And the other one is a North American thing called Corner Store, where these little stores are, are, are into the community and they're very accessible, very family-like. Their business plan uh, was supposed to go open up shops all over the MTR stations. So essentially, they're like little corner stones all over Hong Kong where change can happen. But at the same time, because they're so in the community, uh, it's now a corner store. So, so the word corner was a critical word because uh, corner, corner stone and corner store uh, they're, the corner is the, the, the unifying word. And I wanted to make sure that we connected the two things. So not only changes around the corner, but, the, but it's also helping people understand the, uh, the forecast of it, like what, what could happen next. Almost like if there's any new health trend that's gonna happen, it's gonna happen here first. So I'm connecting that story. That story. Um, whether or not they're actually able to open up into all the NTR stations, that's another question. Uh, but I can tell you their one store is still in business for the last four years. They haven't closed shop. Uh, so that's a good sign. So the corner block is the main, from that, everything came from the marketing, yeah. your whole story. Yeah. So getting that name right is very important. Yeah. And like even this one, like Co and Co. Actually, actually, are there any more questions? I can I can kind of stop because I can go on forever. Mm -hmm. I talk stop. No more questions. <coughs> okay. Um, so should we wrap it up? And no more questions. Are you not showing this? <coughs> sure. I like what you say about everybody has their own glasses to see the world. Yeah, thank you. So when, when it's really very philosophical, but when you have certain kind of brand, uh, maybe just pick a brand, I don't know, computer, anything, do you think of a certain commonality in terms of everybody? Because everybody sees things differently, though, right? You try to pick something that everybody can agree on certain things? Or not? No, that's not my, I actually don't do that at all. Mm -hmm. My job is to, Okay, let's say you're the owner of that computer store, okay? My job is to vi like vividly draw out your perspective, your opinion out, and make it a conversation piece. And then have people engage with that. And then you don't, you don't wanna be that company that gets influenced by everyone else, okay? So uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Kanye West fan. He was just on the David Letterman, My Next Guest Is, and he talked about Kanye West's uh, superpower. And he goes, David goes to Kanye and goes, you must be, your ability to influence people must be your superpower. And then Kanye West goes, no, my ability to not be influenced is my superpower. Mm -hmm. So when, when I, brand businesses, I'm kind of like studio faculty. I want them to be the next studio faculty, that you have your own 
pearls that you're going to be so authentic to and you're not going to sway and then what ends up happening you almost if you do it correctly people will conform to you whereas a, a a business that always conforms to everyone else is a very uh schizophrenic and and low confidence type of business mm -hmm. and that's what i don't want for my clients you said a new trend okay yeah Right. More questions? Okay. All right. Join us to thank uh, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you.